Hey guys, this is Jeff Stanek with Figured Out Baseball. Uh, we've got a great podcast for you today, uh, quite a bit of a different podcast than we typically have. Uh, we've got Gary Sheffield Jr. on the phone with us today on the podcast. Um, he's someone that is a, a growing personality on social media and with his website, and I, I thought it'd be someone cool to have on, especially this time of year. There have been a lot of things uh, that have been in the news lately that Gary's had some opinions on, and, and I thought he's got a good enough perspective where It'd be fun to have him on the podcast. So uh, I don't think he needs much more of an introduction uh, with the name that he's got. But uh, but Gary, appreciate you spending some time with us on the podcast today. Oh man, thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me, man. I'm, I mean, you know me. I love to talk sports. So uh, talking with another sports junkie, man. I'm right at home. <laughs> yeah, it should be a fun conversation to have. Uh, well, well, Gary, I, I know uh, just to start things off. I don't know if you want to say anything about your website. Not that this is, you know, we need to make it a free pitch for you, but but athleteswire.com is something that you started up recently to talk about some things that are going on and talk about or talk with some former athletes. Do you want to talk about that at all? Just kind of tell people what you're doing with that. Again, it's it's athleteswire.com. Yeah, I'm I'm actually just in the process right now of getting everything approved with like iTunes and everything. We're starting a podcast, and I'll bring on some guys that that at least I know personally that are within the game, and I feel like we would like to have conversation about just like we're doing here and um, discuss the game, like where it's headed. Cause there's a lot of people right now that are in the game that don't like where the game's headed. So um, I thought what better way to try to steer the game, the right direction of where the fans want it to go than starting a podcast. So that's where we're at right now. Really cool. And I, I watched uh, some of the episodes that you've got. And I think you're doing a really good thing there. Um, just to kind of talk about what you just said about the direction the game is headed and people don't necessarily love it. Uh, well, some people don't necessarily love it. I, you know, I'm a, yeah. I'm a real purist, I guess, a baseball purist. I, I have a hard time with things changing. Uh, I, I think that, and, and it's not for any other reason, Gary, than I just think, I think the game is perfect as it is. I, I love the game. I've loved the game since I was a little kid. Uh, I'm from around Pittsburgh and I've been going to pirate games uh, since I can remember with my dad. Uh, my, you know, my brother, my uncle, and it's just, it's just something that I love. Uh, today it's, it's February 21st. I believe spring training games start tomorrow. Uh, it's, it is, you know, the most exciting time of the year for me just because I love the sport. There's nothing better to me than, than going out and watching a good, clean game of baseball. But some of the things that are happening, as you mentioned, um, I, I guess they're, they're difficult to deal with. They're difficult to kind of see the way the game is going. What have you noticed? I mean, what, what things are on your mind with the way that, that the game is, is progressing, whether it's, you know, progress that you like or don't like, you know, things about the game that are, that are kind of moving and changing that, uh, that you notice and that maybe you don't think are necessarily the best thing for the game. Well, I think we're seeing a lot of guys with the analytics, right? The analytics have gotten into the game and how do you adjust to those, how do you adjust to those analytics? And a lot of people say, well, you can try to go to opposite field, try to do all types of stuff. Well, then you're seeing all types of other adjustments that the commissioner's made that he's kind of, I mean, I would probably say he's lied about, right, with the baseballs, and they started to juice the baseballs. Well, why are you trying to go the other way to hit a single? And so you basically have a a world where the game is being changed by studies. Like, people have actually figured out algorithms of how to play this game, and it it doesn't even resemble the game that I grew up loving, which kind of stinks, right? I mean, you come to the field, and yeah, it's baseball, and you say play ball, but if the shortstop's playing down the left field line, is that really the sport that I grew up loving? Is this the sport I want to teach my grandkids to love? I'm not so sure about that. Do you think that there's a lot of things, well, a lot of things to get into there. First of all, let's talk about the baseballs. We talked about this before we started recording, but what are you hearing with the baseballs that's going to be, that's going to be changing right now for the 2020 season? Well, right now I, I always, I always try to get my hands on a baseball itself. Just over the last few years, I remember as soon as the 2017 postseason started, I really started to dig into it of like, wow, I'm like, why is there a game being played 14 to 12 with great pitching on the mound, Kershaw's on the mound? I I remember it being 4 nothing in Dodgers in like game, it was whatever that crazy circus game was in Houston. And I'm sitting there thinking, how is Clayton Kershaw losing a game that they're winning, they're scoring 8, 9, 10 runs? And then I started to realize, I'm like, hey, can someone grab me a baseball? And so I have one in my house, and I've looked at the baseballs over the years, and there's plenty of people smarter than me, that believe me, that have looked at these baseballs and studied them. These baseballs aren't even similar to what 
my my dad or what anybody in like 2010 or 2012 what they were using so when you're drastically changing the equipment we can probably start to expect that the baseball is like like the game is just going to change and how it's played and right now from what i've heard because i've gotten my hands on a 2020 spring training ball these seams are significantly higher than any other baseball that's been used since probably 2016 i would say so you're going to start to notice I would start saying, like, the pitchers are going to drastically start dominating the game. I would assume there's going to be a lot more drag, and you're not going to see balls flying out of the park like you were last year. So it should be interesting to see how they adjust. If that's something that you you grew up in, in a family where obviously home runs paid the bills. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> is that something that you, that you like to see or don't like to see with the, the reduction of home runs? Like, do you, do you like the game where it seems like, you know, there are skinny shortstops that are hitting 25 homers. And, and it, like, if you if you want to be a, you know, 30 homers doesn't make you a power hitter anymore. So you've got to hit 40 homers to be considered a power guy. Uh, do, you, do you like, are, are you happy about the, maybe the trend going back the other way where pitchers uh, will maybe dominate a little bit more and, and the run scoring will come down and maybe we don't, we aren't seeing teams break home run records? Or, or do you like the style of the game that's been played the last couple of years? Well, I love home runs. I mean, I feel like everybody loves home runs, but, I, I see home runs as like steak and lobster, like a nice steak dinner. If you if you have if you have steak dinner every night, I mean, how nice is it, right? Eventually, you just your perspective changes on seeing a home run ball. I mean, when I see a home run now, I'm like, all right, well, who's going to hit home run next, or are they going to go back to back? Things things just change. My pers- my whole perspective on the home run ball has changed now that it's become so frequent. When I when I see a little guy like Cattel Marte, I'm a Diamondbacks fan. I was, I mean, I'm a Yankee fan, but. I'm here in Arizona, so I go to a lot of D-backs games. I see guys like Cattell Marte. I'm like, this guy is not a – he's not. he was never a power hitter, and then all of a sudden he's just a he's, – he's hitting 35, 40 home runs, and I basically can expect him to hit a home run almost every at-bat. So it's almost like the buzz has gone away from the home run ball. So I would say it's kind of miserable to watch. Like, honestly, I would love it to be harder and the stronger players to be able to hit home runs so that there's some t- like type of anticipation for an at-bat instead of every moment there's a home run. I've got to be honest. The, the game gets harder to watch for me the more that it's it's the, the three true outcomes and that's all you see, right? You, it's either, you know, home run, strikeout, walk. Like, that's basically the game. And uh, mm-hmm. I, I guess I just – I like baseball because I think that a good manager, somebody who can think a little bit, you know, the guy that can that, – that, you know, that is a good hitting coach, uh, can really affect the game. Um, you know, I, I like to see some things happen during the game as opposed to just waiting for the next guy to hit a home run. Like you said, it seems like, especially in the playoffs, it's like, you know, if there are if there are 10 total runs scored in the game that, you know, nine of them came on home runs. And that's just, to me, it's a little bit of a boring brand of baseball when you have, um, you know, one team strikes out 15 guys and gives up three homers, and that's basically your, your box score right there. It's... Um, I like, I'd rather have a game, you know, college baseball to me, college sports, I think sometimes people always look at as a little bit more pure form of of any game, football, basketball, whatever it may be. Um, I love college baseball and going to watch a game, obviously the metal bats there. So you still, uh, you can have some really high scoring games, but you know, I I like the college game where there's just, there's more happening. Guys are trying to steal more bases. There's more action on the bases. Um, Right. You know, you've got to hit a, a single or a double occasionally to score a run as opposed to just one through nine yeah. trying to hit the balls over the fence. And uh, and that's the exciting part to me. So I would agree with you that, you know, Aaron Judge, uh, I think he should still be able to hit a lot of homers because he's giant and, you know, he's got tons of power. Yeah. But um, I, I'd like for some other guys, I guess, to have some other skills besides just trying to hit the ball over the wall all the time. Right. You're seeing that in the NBA. You're seeing a lot of guys shoot three-pointers. I'm like, dude. Sometimes I'm watching a guy make four or five three-pointers, and they'll they'll praise him after the game. I'm like, I just watched ten games in a row where like he was trying to do this exact same thing, and this is not his skill set. I would love to see some different avenues for a different style player. You're seeing guys like Nick Madrigal, who's coming up through the White Sox system. He's more of a Tony Gwynn style player. I'm sure at some point they're going to try to convert him into more of a power threat. At some point, if he hits ten to twelve homers, they're going to try to turn him into a twenty homer guy, and as a pure baseball, um, as a pure baseball fan, I would love to see different styles. I would love to see a Nick Madrigal 
that I watched in the College World Series dominate a game by being able to have superior bat to ball skills. So at some point, there's got to be there's got to be something different out there on the field. Let me ask you this, Gary. This is maybe getting a little deep. Um, do you think that the game has become what it is? Because is it because the ball's changed and because everybody, you know, it, you know, relatively speaking, everybody could hit, everybody could be a thirty homer guy. Has it changed because, um, and this is this is one of my own theories, uh, because pitchers are so good and they throw so hard and their stuff is so good that teams feel like we, we're not going to string four hits, four or five hits together. Like if we're going right. to score. The only way we're going to score is if you hit the ball over the wall, or are, are guys not trying, are teams and, and individuals not trying to string together hits, meaning like guys aren't trying to just, you know, hit a single double, guys are trying to hit double homer. So I mean, do you have any, any thoughts about that? Is it, is, did the game force people to start doing this, or uh, is it just kind of a natural progression? Is strength training this much better, where everybody's got a chance to be this big and strong and powerful, or even the guys that weigh 185 pounds? just because of their training, the way they're training, you know, they have a chance to hit homers. Like, do you have any thoughts or ideas of why the game has sort of turned into what it is? Well, I think that the problem with Major League Baseball right now and just the attendance issues is that after the 2016 season, that's where the power pitcher really became just the norm, right? Every, every guy was like, at first we saw Noah Syndergaard in the World Series and we're like, wow, I mean, 92, 93 with a slider and a, and a 92 mile an hour change up, 101. And, you know what, every pitcher became that. And I think the issue really became that Rob Manfred saw that strikeouts were up because guys were just trying to hit for power, that he wanted to help that and help that work so that we wouldn't see two to nothing, one to nothing games. And I, I believe he thought that the steroid era was just popular because guys were hitting home runs. But what he, what he didn't understand is that there were plenty guys in between. There were plenty Nick. There were Nick Madrigals all over the field in that era as well. There were people still becoming experts at their craft, the Dustin Pedroyas. And now you see far less of it because there's really no room for it. So, how are you supposed to? How are you supposed to be expecting these players to work on going the other way when you just change the baseball? If you just if you just created a new baseball where guys are hitting. At one point, he's hitting 20 home runs in Suarez, and then he becomes a 50 home run guy. He's going to get paid like a 50 home run guy. So why in the world would he work on something to make the game more enjoyable for us as pure baseball fans? So you really have a combination of just the the training has gotten so ridiculous with the velocities, and then the the technique of hitting is just going the opposite direction of the way baseball is initially taught. These guys are not trained to hit 100 miles an hour with movement, so you're just going to watch the three outcomes over and over again, and then the ratings are going to continue to drop over and over again until Rob Manfred decides that, you know what, I've got to go back to the old equipment, and this, the coaching, will they're going to have to adapt, otherwise guys are going to start losing their jobs, right? So really Rob, Man, Rob Manfred's going to have to start pulling some strings to, to get guys to react and respond the way that we're hoping. I know that you've been pretty outspoken about some other stuff that, that Rob Manfred has done. Um, you know, I, I've got my own feelings about, uh, about him and, and how, he's, how he's been for baseball, uh, you know, which people are on the podcast to listen to me <laughs> and listen to my opinion. Uh, but, but, Gary, what do you think, how do you feel that Rob Manfred has done? You know, the, the commissioner's job is to, to keep the game, you know, healthy, to make people – interested in the game and to do what's best for the game. Uh, how do you think he's done so far, in your opinion, to do that? You've mentioned some things already that, that you don't love, but, I mean, overall, uh, you know, I guess how do you think that Rob Manfred's been for baseball so far? Well, I think he's opened the eyes of the owners. The owners have realized we don't need the fans' interest to be at peak level to make a profit. If you look at the profits around the league, the Arizona Diamondbacks made 5%. They had a 5% growth this last year. And 5%, I know it doesn't sound like much, but to an, for an organization that's worth a billion dollars, to be able to make 5% profit, these owners are saying, well, what's the problem here? I mean, I know we might be able to make some more money if we had a little bit more interest, but if our profits are up, the owners are happy. So 
half his job is to work for the owner. So in their eyes, he's doing a great job. They couldn't care less if we're complaining about Houston because they're still going to – if they might fill up half the stands, but if profits keep coming in, his job is to be the middleman between the fans and the owners and keep the peace, and he's not doing that. So I would say he's doing an average job. I mean, this whole Houston thing looks like a disaster. But all in all, he's never going to lose his job unless the owners are unhappy. And I know for a fact with the revenues that they're showing, uh, they're ecstatic. I mean, I would be too. I mean, when money's coming in, everything's great, right? <laughs> in most industries, yes. I'm a, I'm a Pirates fan, as I mentioned, and the Pirates who, who have uh, – their attendance has gone down the last handful of years. Obviously, they're, they're, not, they're, they're not expected by anybody to be competitive in 2020, you know, probably outside of their own dugout. Um, and even that might be just a little bit of lip service more than anything else. But, uh, you know, but they, they've seen incredible profits, and it's written about uh, in, in Pittsburgh um, media, and it's, it's, it's tough to see much changing, as, as you said, in anything, whether it's what the commissioner is doing or whether what an individual team is doing as long as the, the dollars are still coming in. Um, right. Rob Manfred has done some weird things, <laughs> I'll say weird things, to try to – uh, that, that appear to be to try to make people more interested in baseball. Um, uh, you know, one of the things most recently is, is there's there's talk. I don't know anything, that anything's official yet, but in 2022, I believe it'll be uh, to change the playoff format to have seven teams and to have, you know to, the teams be able to pick their opponents and some other things like that that I just I think are so it's such a strange way, uh, strange things to do, but it seems like he's doing it to try to. Uh, just create more buzz around baseball or get more people interested. You've had some interesting thoughts about that. Um, one of your one of the things that you've tweeted about if Major League Baseball wants to fix the problem uh, or wants to fix the attendance in baseball um, instead of letting marginal teams in the playoffs create create instead an environment that influences teenagers to continue to play baseball in high school. Uh, and this will this will solve the problem. Can you talk a little bit about that? Just about your ideas about um, instead of doing these these off the wall things that he's got in mind, just getting more younger people involved and playing and, and interested at that age, just in, interested in the sport in general, and that'll help Major League Baseball to grow. Right. I mean, I think part of that part of that little theory I had there about fixing, because of course nothing's set in stone. Nothing I'm saying is is proven right or anything. Just just theories and. The thing I would say about it is that when I played baseball and I was in high school, base I understood that when I brought someone to a baseball game and, you know, you bring a girl on a date or you bring a friend or whatever to the Diamondbacks game at Chase Field, it's a very tedious sport, but it, there's so much beauty in the sport itself. It's just like golf. If you sit there and you kind of think about how much time you're really spending at the field and just what how little action is really happening on a baseball field, you're like, wow. I'm pretty bored right now, but when you actually grow up and understand how difficult the game of baseball is, and it's the same thing with golf. Once you go to a range and you finally start hitting balls down the middle and you, you're slicing balls off the tee, you're like, you finally can turn on the TV and watch for four hours and understand how beautiful the game of baseball is. And nobody's going to understand that. You're not just going to have people turn on ESPN and go, this is exciting. Because that's the way – baseball has never been that way. Baseball is – you are – it's something that you are taught to love and that you grow into. It's like the taste of beer. You, you, it's, it tastes awful at first. You're like, why in the world am I playing this thing? You go to golf and you hit a ground ball off the tee. Why am I playing this sport? But then all of a sudden when you start playing better and you start understanding the game and what you have to do to, to un, just understand it all together, baseball becomes so much fun and – I don't even care so much about pace of play, all these little adjustments they're trying to make. That's not what makes me, who loves baseball, come to the game or not. It's honestly more about prices and the fact that I understand the game and I love the game already, so there's nothing you're selling me. I'm coming to the game anyway. So the old school fan, that's somebody who grew up in the game and got to play the game. Like You have got to get people – to have a love for this game before you can ask them to spend 75 bucks just to sit down inside your, your stadium for five hours, that's not going to happen. So you, they need to figure out new angles of how to get people in the seats and it needs to be cheaper too. I mean, we can, we could touch on that too. I mean, goodness gracious to get into a stadium. Now it used to be chase field. I can show up with eight, 12 bucks and 
hop in there, spend five bucks on a soda, and I'm good. Now it's like it's like a trip to Disneyland. I don't know what they're doing. Yeah, couldn't agree more. It's, it's hard. Again, this is my, my point of reference, but I know that the tickets continue to go up. My dad was a season ticket holder with the Pirates since the 80s, and 2019 oh, wow. was the first season that he was not a season ticket holder. And he shared with a couple other guys, but basically the, the group that had been sharing tickets you know, for, for 30, 35 years, they all decided that it's, it, it continues to get more expensive. Um, and they're not putting a product on the field. Like, why Why would we continue to have season tickets? So my family will still go, um, you know, but but as far as the whole group goes, like, we were about the only ones that were interested in, in keeping those tickets. The prices are outrageous. The, the you know, the food there is outrageous. The, the price of food is outrageous. Yeah. And um, and it's it's for, you know, like you said, the, the people that are grew up, that grew up that are baseball uh, fans for life like you and I, I'm still going to go to games. But... Yeah, the casual fan. Honestly, can you can you afford? I have, I have five uh, or three kids. So I have five people in my family. Can I really? How how many times can I take five people to a major league baseball game in a year? You know, if I want to take my family, time right? And it's uh, I've, yeah, I've got a minor league team in, in the town that I live in. I'd much rather take my kids to a minor league game where the tickets are affordable, the the food is affordable, there's stuff on the field that's actually that's keeping them entertained between innings. You know that's a, a great oh, experience yeah. for my family, but it, it's like to to drag them all to a pirate game. I mean, we'll have to it, it'll break the bank to take them like once or twice, especially if they want some sort of a souvenir or something. Um, mm-hmm. You know, some of the things that I I've thought of, and I've seen this on social media. It's not like I'm coming up with it myself, but other things that that just to help promote the game and to help make people interested is just to promote the athletes a little bit. Um, you know, there are restrictions on, on what can go on social media, and you really don't see much of anything as far as baseball highlights. Compared to other pro sports, you hardly ever see baseball highlights on, on social media, and that's because of the restrictions that are, uh, that are put on the media. And in fact, I, I know one of the guys at our local, uh, the AA team where I live, and he said that even they are restricted from putting things out on Twitter. Like, they can't put a highlight out there about, you know, something to happen because Major League Baseball wants to control everything. How much do you think that plays a part uh, in in just the interest of young kids and, and a young kids kind of growing up idolizing major leaguers. I mean, well, it, it plays the biggest, it's the biggest role. I mean, look at, look at Ken Griffey Jr. I used to, I used to come home and see Ken Griffey Jr. everywhere. He, he was on TV everywhere. It was, it was, he's on my box of cereal. He's on the socks. He's, he's the hat. Everyone's got their hat backwards. We knew his style. I even knew, like, we all knew the style of Ken Griffey Jr., just his aura, and we understood that before social media, like all these little, all these advances that are supposed to help grow this game, and they've used it in the opposite way. It's a bunch of people saying, calling dibs and saying, I have rights to this, and I've got rights to that. They've got to find a way to really unlock this game. If I, you've just got a bunch of people bickering about who owns the rights to what. I'm like, I can't start a YouTube video and say, hey, here's a highlight of Alex Bregman hitting the home run. And with, and then you're saying, hey, look, you can hear the bang in the background. And then they just take it off. Like, it's the same thing with PGA. <laughs> and that people are saying, oh, I don't understand why the game's not growing or people don't want to come to the game. I'm like, do you understand that people, like, this stuff gets around. Hey, watch this video. Look at Alex Bregman. He walks the bat to first base. If that stuff went viral more often, you would have people say, hey, that looks pretty fun. I might want to try to reenact being Alex Bregman, but kids don't want to be Alex Bregman anymore. Nobody cares. They just turn on the NFL and say, ah, I'd rather be Tom Brady. Or I'd rather be Kyler Murray. And it, there's a reason that those guys are, those two sport athletes are saying, hey, why would I go play this sport? Nobody's going to know my name. I'll, I'll go to Orange Julius. Nobody will recognize me. Mike, Mike Trout could walk inside of a, a, a he could go inside of a, Steakhouse right here downtown Scottsdale, and nobody would recognize him. Nobody. And he's probably the best player I've seen since – he's probably the best right-handed hitter I've seen since my dad played with Miguel Cabrera. Really. I've never seen a player this good all around, and nobody knows who he is other than diehard sports fans, and that's a shame. They've, they've got to figure out a way to unlock these guys' potential with social media and just get their names out there, get their styles out there, and encourage these guys to grow this game. Yeah, I saw a tweet this past week, and I wish I could find it right now. Um, 
but uh, it was if Mike Trout has a war of eight this year, the people that he will pass. And the names were unbelievable, and he's 28 years old. In fact, I've got it pulled up right now. So he's going to, if he has this year, he's got a chance to pass Larry Walker, Jim Tomey, Frank Thomas, Reggie Jackson, Johnny Bench, Paul Molitor. These are all guys that are within range this year. Uh, Ozzy Smith, yeah. Joe DiMaggio. He's going to pass freaking Joe DiMaggio in war this year, and, and people don't know who he is. And it's such a shame because I, I think that there are there are more potential superstars in the game right now than than there have been maybe in, you know in a long time. And there are so many people that should be recognizable, and they're not. Um, right. Another issue that I have, Gary, and I don't know if you would have experienced this or not, uh, but I don't have cable in my house. Haven't had cable for a long time. It just you know doesn't make sense to us at this point. But we've got. I've got Netflix and Hulu, and I've got YouTube TV. I can't, and I also have major. I also have MLB TV. I can't watch the Pirates locally. I cannot watch the Pirate game live. Now I'm enough of a nut that I I try my best to avoid scores, and I come to my office the next day and I put my iPad up, and, and I watch the I watch yesterday's game. You know, the next morning. Oh wow! Um, I just that, that's I, that's how. You know, I, I just I like the game like that, and I, I want to see what's going on, and, and I love the Pirates, so I'm going to watch them. But mm-hmm. I know that I've seen a lot on social media about that, and um, I just I don't know – I don't even know what what how much you can say about that to say how important that is. But if my – so I've got three kids at home, and I've, I've got a girl boy and another girl. My three-year-old boy loves baseball. I can't sit there at night yeah. and watch a Pirate game. Like, what does that do for the game? Right. It's It's just – it's it's horrific because when I used to come home, I was in junior high when my dad was in New York. So at that point, he was in the prime of his career. He's playing in a major market, and of course, they're being they're being broadcast by Yes Network, and Yes Network is as big as it gets. So for me, I would rush home. We get out at three forty five. I would dart. I and I was within I was within about a five ten minute drive, and I would run home, just sprint home. And I couldn't wait to get there right before I would get there about 358, 359, and I would turn it to channel 622 on DirecTV, and I knew as soon as the clock hit 4 o'clock, Yes Network was going to pop up. And that was a huge part of my childhood and nostalgia for the game of baseball. It was I immediately was already – I was already excited before the game even started. So that excitement that you have – I mean, you have it watching the Pirates on TV locally. I had that same excitement about the Yankees and Yes Network. It was literally, like people talk about Cartoon Network and Disney Channel. I didn't give a rip what they were talking about. I came home to watch Yankees baseball. And now if that was no longer available to me because of the prices and all types of stuff, I'm a fan that you no longer have. So now my kids are not going to be fans and my grandkids don't even, they haven't heard of baseball. So how are you going to grow the game when you basically just stop it? Like at this point, it's going to be more difficult for you to teach your kids or even want to teach your kids to love this game because it's not accessible. So you're just not – like a lot of times people just say, oh, I'm not even going to bother. There's no point. I'm just going to let my kids play Fortnite, and then they won't even – they won't know who the starting center fielder is for the Yankees, and they won't know Mike Trout is this good. So the Major League Baseball has got to figure out a way to make it more affordable for families to make this game – uh, broadcast out on national airways, man. They, they've got to do a much better job. And they, they've looked at the dollar amounts of how much people are making. And once they figured out that we're making money without this many eyeballs watching and losing audience, but we're still making more, they stopped, they stopped caring and they stopped figuring out new ways and being innovative. So it's really tough. They're in a bad spot. Yeah, like you said, it's, it's, it's hard to believe that the revenues continue to go up when there are all these issues that it seems so obvious, and you hear major leaguers. If you if you're on social media, you see major leaguers that are talking about this stuff, um, that are outspoken about uh, the different things that they'd like to see about uh, just making the game more accessible to people. And the local TV market thing is just something that doesn't make any sense to me. Why you'd want someone like me? Why you know why you're going to penalize me for not wanting to pay 150 bucks a month or whatever it is for cable uh, when that's the only thing that the only thing that I would gain from that would be to watch this one channel. You know, I, I pay for the MLB TV package. Why can't you give me an option? I, honestly, Gary, I, I'd pay an extra, I mean, it's 100 whatever forty dollars a year or something like that for MLB TV. I'd pay an extra 10 20 25 bucks, whatever it be, whatever it would need to be to be able to pay for access to watch the Pirates. 
You know what I mean? And I'm sure yeah, there are. Hard. Right. That's all I care. I, I paid that extra just just to be able to watch those blacked out games every day. And I'm sure that there are yep. thousands of people across the country who are in the same boat who would pay all, you know, who would gladly pay a little bit extra uh, to watch their local team yep. when they don't have cable. It's just, it's, it's something that just seems so obvious to me. Um, yeah. But, but it's not done. You know, I, I don't want to spend the whole time talking about how bad the game is because I think there's a lot, a lot of great things about the game. Um, and, and certainly there are a lot of things that need to be fixed or that you'd like to see fixed. But I think there's so much, there's so much good uh, stuff going on in the game as well. And I, we certainly should spend some time uh, talking about that. Uh, one of the things I actually like to ask you about is just about, uh, about your, you know, your, your childhood growing up, uh, growing up around the game. Um, obviously, uh, your dad is, is one of the most well-known players of, of the, you know, of his generation, certainly. And he's a guy that still has been re- retired for, for probably, probably close to 10 years. And people still know the name, uh, really well. People still probably intimidating or, uh, uh imitating his stance. Uh, I know I, I used to do that and still do with backyard wiffle ball and if I'm playing with my brother or something like that. Uh, but what was it like for you to grow up in that sort of environment, uh, you know, to, to, to have his name uh, and just to kind of grow up a, around major league players like you did? Well, it, it really got this, it really showed me the preparation of a lot of my heroes. I was always a big Derek Jeter fan growing up, especially even before my dad ever played with the guy. You always saw Derek Jeter. I was like, goodness gracious, like, what is this guy doing that separating him from the pack? And it, it doesn't even it doesn't even so much have to do with sports. I mean, you can look at any profession and you can say, why is this guy, why is this guy creating Amazon and then other people aren't? Well, it's just the dedication and all the time that you start to see. And once I got to meet the guys, I started to understand exactly what they did to separate themselves. They were more innovative. They were more forward thinking. Uh, they were obsessed with figuring out and dominating their problems. And Derek Jeter, a lot of people think, oh, all he did was work on the jump throw and all types of – Derek Jeter, what made these guys such great overall players, especially the guys in the 80s and 90s, like that style of baseball, is they worked on things they weren't good at. And that's something that I really learned growing up, being in the locker room, is that that era was spent of people perfecting their craft and – like we're seeing today, a lot of guys are becoming experts at one thing, and it's becoming a little, uh, like a little stale. You're starting to see everybody do the same thing well, but that era was just so much fun to watch. And hopefully, we start seeing Nick Magical guys with the White Sox and sprinkle in some of that uh, where they perfect their craft, and it becomes more fun and enjoyable to watch the game. And I think it could head in that direction if the baseball responds well and with all the changes that they're hoping to make. But the game, just growing up around the locker room, was just it taught me just how to prepare and just really try to excel at whatever you do, if it's sports or not. Certainly the ball is not flying out of the park as much as it has in the past. Guys are going to need to make an adjustment. It'll be interesting to see if that's the case, if that happens during the season yeah. or something, guys, that, that happens over the course of a couple of years. Um, you know, but, but on the – I hate to, like, you know, beat the Pirates to death, but – on the Pirates team, they've got uh, Brian Reynolds and Kevin Newman, a couple of young guys that, um, you know, Reynolds has got some power, but they're both guys that, that seem like they are they want to be high batting average guys. They want to be high on base guys, and certainly they want to do some slugging. Yeah. But to me, they're, they're, they're exciting to watch because it's not, it's not going to, it's not either, you know, fly out, strike out, or home run. They, they do have some of the things they can mm-hmm. do, and I, I think it's a fun brand uh, of baseball to watch. Um, you know, for you growing up, so you saw the preparation of the guys that, that your dad played with. Um, you know, for people like me that can't imagine being around some of the names that you were around growing up, who were some of the coolest guys that you got to be around? Maybe guys that, that you had a little bit of stars in your eyes, or maybe even guys that you didn't realize, like, how big of stars they were until you stepped back a little bit, maybe got a little bit older. But who were some of the cooler names that you got to be around as a kid because of your dad? Some all-star games with Ken Griffey Jr. were super cool. Uh, every year I'd go to the, the all-star game. I would go every year, and they used to let us on the field for the home run derby. Well, my dad was in it for one year, and he did terrible. I think he had, like, four home runs in the first round. I, I guess he didn't really have, like, the style of swing for that type of tournament. But during that tournament, I guess – I couldn't remember who hit a ball, but they hit a ball in the deep left center field, and Ichiro picked me up. And he lifted me over the wall, and I robbed a home run. And the guy on the Jumbotron was like, they screamed at us. They're like, hey, 
like no robin home runs like they were screaming at us like it was it was funny <laughs> just some of the some of the stuff that we did around the field that these guys were a lot nicer guys than people make it out to believe because you know people have so many experiences that negative things would get out into the airwaves like Randy Johnson's not a great guy and all that stuff but to be honest with you when you get to know all these people like Randy Johnson specifically they really are some there are some really nice guys in the game Jason Giambi is the number one guy that I think about when I think of nice players he's the nicest guy I've ever met in my life and the cool part about it was that he didn't need to be right you just you don't have to be a nice person when you when you have money and you have everyone saying yes to you all the time everyone loves you you don't really have to be a very nice person so the fact that some of these guys took the time and made it enjoyable for me to be around the field dude it was so much fun that's really cool so you got to be at some home run dirt or some all-star games home run derby type things those are always so cool i think to see it's one of the coolest moments i think when they have the home run derby and they uh they show the kids with the you know with their dad on the field i think that's so cool because there are often times when, you know, you can look – you see guys in the big leagues now, um, like Vladimir Guerrero Jr., and, and you can see footage of him, like yeah. when he was a kid on the field with his dad. That, that kind of stuff is, is really, really cool. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. Who was – so you were growing up, and obviously, in, uh, whether people know this or not, I don't know, but you played college baseball. Um, did anybody in particular – help you as a player so i know you you kind of talk about little, the prep a little bit and just kind of what you learned from guys but did anybody necessarily help you take you aside and just help you as a player physically like you know go in a cage with you and hit throw some you know, throw a little bit of bp to you or anything like that is there anybody that kind of helped you along uh those lines well it was funny is like when i was i learned a lot about the game when i couldn't remember like when my dad was playing with the dodgers there there was like this there was always like a couple guys around the field because they were always so busy working on their own craft. Like my dad was always so busy. He'd come out there when he could, but there was always like, I remember um, Ricky Henderson used to like soft toss me all the time and I would hit the ball. I was so little at the time that they would turn me around and I would hit the ball over the backstop net and for just pretend it was a home run and all that stuff. But as I became like older and got into college, my dad was, he was across the country all the way in Florida and I was in Arizona so I always tried to just embrace whatever coaching I had and just try to learn the best I could. Um, but I never tried to make it like my dad said this, so you don't really know what you're talking about. Like, you know, you try to, I tried to have fun with it and just enjoy the game. Cause I, I always knew that if I didn't end up making it in baseball, which I always had like grades issues, I was always terrible in school. So I didn't get to go where I committed, which was Florida state. And once I didn't do all that stuff, I always knew that, I was going to try to get into the media and really affect this game. And that's where my love was for the game. And that you could still always be paid and do all that stuff outside of playing the game itself. You can just be involved and still do all that. So once I, once I really got outside of the game playing wise, I was, it was time to transition and just learn from the guys I was around. So what's your goal now? Um, you know, now that, your your playing days are behind you. You've started Athletes Wire. Uh, what what do you really want to do? Like, what's your what do you want your role to be in the game going forward? To affect Rob Manfred's thinking, right? <laughs> I think a lot of fans. I feel like I feel like a lot of fans feel that way. Is you have a, some progressive ideas about how you want to watch Pirates baseball in your local market, and say, hey, why am I spending this amount of money? And the commissioner can start to get the wheels turning in a direction that can actually start affecting things like that, making it easier for networks. I mean, direct TV, all types of, maybe you can get some kind of thing like Apple TV where it's just a USB plug-in, but it can stream the game that you want to see and stuff like that. Right. And unlocking all the, all the coverages where they say you can't do this because yes, network has the rights. If they could start figuring out ways to get a microphone in front of the fan to where you could start understanding the way they feel and that how they think we can solve all these problems instead of just having a bunch of guys in suits telling us how we're going to live our lives. It's, um, I would feel very satisfied with my life if at the end of it, people could say that I affected the growth of this game and it actually improved the growth of this game. That's my only goal. So that's the whole point of Athletes Wire. That's why I'm starting the podcast. I know you're trying to grow the game off the field as well. I mean, it's just things like that is that that's how this game is going to grow. And 
you, they'll start making more money listening to us as well. It's not like we're just trying to make them lose money so we can have a good life. Like we're trying to achieve both. So that's the goal. Very cool. So you don't have any intention of, uh, you know, you don't want to coach or anything like that. You just, you want to stay in the media. This is kind of your sweet spot. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it really is like my sweet spot. I don't really want to coach or anything. I think that if I ever got into a front office, I would love doing that. Um, I love sitting there talking you know, how we're going to like scouting and this guy and like which kind of guy should we should make moves for a style player? How should we coach a guy? Um, like how should we prepare this prospect? Should we move in positions? All those type of things like that makes the game enjoyable for me. But in terms of coaching, I never really was big into coaching. I mean, I love the game, but I'm not, I don't know. I just, for some reason it, it wasn't my ticket. Very cool. There's a lot of things you can do in the media to have a, a great impact on things. And, um, you know, it certainly helps that, that you, you know, some people, uh, you've got some connections that can help along the way. That always helps a lot. Um, I, I want to ask you, Gary, just a little bit about something else that's, that's, uh, I guess, present right now at the time that we're in, uh, late February right now with everything that's going on with the Astros. I know that maybe sometimes this gets played to death a little bit, but, but let's kind of get your take on things. Um, you know, and, and, and again, you, you grew up, you know, being in the dug, being, you know, being around players and kind of being in that, that atmosphere. I know that you, uh, you have a relationship with guys that are in the big leagues right now. Uh, and it's, it's not, it's not like guys are hiding the way that they feel about, uh, about what happened, but it's, it's kind of been, I can't remember another time when players have been so outspoken about other players. This is one of the only times I can, yeah. I can remember when guys have, have openly talked about, you know, I, I've lost respect for those players and, and, you know, what that team did, like they need to give up their championship. I don't remember that, that happening, even when it, would, when it came to like steroid and things like that. Have you, have you, do you remember anything like happening like this where the players are sort of being that outspoken against one another? Like it is like it's happening right now with the Astros. No, never. And, and what's funny is that a lot of people are upset about the Houston Astros, and they are handling it horrifically. A lot of their quotes say, I don't know what they're doing. They just aren't prepared. But the thing that's amazing to me is that the core of this issue is really just Rob Manfred in the front office of Major League Baseball. Why in the world would you put a real-time video room within arm's distance of the dugout? What do you think these guys were going to do? At some point, somebody – somebody was going to do this, right? I mean, regardless of how many teams around the league are doing it, would you really, did you really believe that some team that's, com that's competing at the highest level wasn't going to be like, dude, what if we just knew the pitches that were coming? It could make, it will probably make the difference between us losing in the ALDS or winning the World Series. Is that worth it? The answer would be yes. Most teams, most players, there's a reason that Mike Fires, like, and I, trust me, I'm happy that Mike Fires came forward. But there is a reason why Mike Fires didn't come forward the second he found out this was, this was going on, because he understood the benefit of what could come from it. So why would you even give these players the, the power to make that decision? As, as the front office, as Rob Manfred, you, as soon as you saw that idea, you, you had to be like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. And it, it all stemmed from the, the replay system. And once they got replays in there, now everybody has to, they need a real time camera and, they opened up the Pandora's box. So right now the whole Astros situation is more of a Major League Baseball issue instead of just angling all the anger and all the change that you want to see. It's not all on the Astros. It's a it's Major League Baseball as a whole. Yeah, replay is another thing that we could probably have a whole podcast about in my my general feelings on, on replay. And not that I think replay in general is bad, but I think that it, it couldn't be worse than the way it's handled right now in, in baseball. But no. but just kind of stick with the <laughs> Astros. Um, <laughs> from, from what you hear from the guys that you know that are playing right now, is it is it pretty well uh, across the board that players think that the 2017 title should be stripped from the Astros? I mean, does anybody feel otherwise, or is everybody is, it, is that pretty well unanimous from what you are hearing from guys? Well, what's amazing about it is I'm hearing a few people tell me how rampant the the cheating was, just in terms of how many teams were doing something similar to this offense. But what's funny is that when I talk to the players themselves directly, it's almost unanimous of people saying that the title should be stripped. So it's almost like they're not cheating, but then at the same time I'm hearing like there's a pretty decent chance that I'm also talking to somebody who's also involved in some form of cheating, but they are smart enough not to get caught, I guess. 
so, but in terms to answer your question, yes, absolutely. Most of the people I talk to are just like, if you cheated at this level, cheating in general isn't the worst thing in the world. I mean, everybody tries to get some type of advantage, but to get an advantage and knowing exactly what's coming, that's different. So most people are telling me, you know, let's get this title out of there. The players, whether the players are suspended or not, we know they can't be now, but at the very least take the title. Do you think this also affects things? It's going to affect things further. I mean, I've read a lot about just all the effects that you don't think about off the top. You know, it, it uh, there were some guys that there, there's actually there's one pitcher that you might have read about this as well, but I think he was at the Blue Jays uh, that the last pitch he ever threw was in an inning against uh, the Astros, and he's not a guy that had like a ten year career. He's a guy that had a uh, a cup of coffee. He wasn't up for very long, but the last pitch he ever threw, uh, he threw an inning or or tried to throw an inning against the Astros. I think he got one out, gave up four runs or something along those lines, and it was one of the games where. Uh, it's been recorded that, that the Astros were using uh, the trash can system, and that was the last pitch the guy ever yeah. threw in the big leagues, and he has sued the Astros uh, because they right. they effectively, they, they may have, they, they who knows how they affected his career. Uh, I guess you never really know, yeah. but but obviously there, there was some sort of effect. I'd read it's also affected, you know, guys that uh, were in the minor leagues that were trying to make it to the big leagues, and there were guys that were maybe sticking in the big leagues because – they were having more success than they would have otherwise because they knew a pitch was coming. And, and you know, don't right. uh, you you can't diminish the effect that that has on a hitter when you when you know it's coming as opposed to when you're up there just the same as everybody else, naked and afraid and you know hoping hoping for the best. Uh, but it affected yeah. so many people beyond just like the World Series title. And um, I guess my my the question I'd like to ask is. Do you think going forward that it's going to affect things like the Astros potentially trying to trade someone? I mean, the the way that major leaguers are talking about guys on the team, on the Astros right now, would a guy from the Astros, could a guy from the Astros be traded to somebody else right now and, and be welcomed into that clubhouse? Like, I wonder if it's going to have effects like that on the Astros going forward. I mean, shoot. Imagine, imagine trying to trade for a guy – that you competed against, I mean, you can already rule out all the teams they really competed with at the highest level. None of those guys, like Houston, none of the, no teammate is coming from Houston to New York. That that would never happen, right? I mean, it could never really. I mean, Garrett Cole, he Garrett Cole happened, but it's weird because he found a niche and he said, "Well, we had no idea as pitchers," so he really kind of got out of it scot free. But can you imagine an Alex Bregman moving over to to New York City? It would just never happen. They just couldn't happen. So it's it's really interesting just to see how this. I would say that the trades. I would never want to trade personally as a fan. I wouldn't want a Houston Astros player on my team. It would just be. I mean, it would just. It's like an open wound. I couldn't. There's no way I could watch it. I actually read. Uh, I just actually didn't read the article, but I saw the the headline that uh, Little League Baseball official Little League Baseball will not have teams called the Astros this year. Did you read that? Did you see that? I I think I saw like a little thing on the ticker at ESPN. I mean that's I mean it's kind of funny. There's so many like little trivial things that people are doing to to get at the Astros and make them talk about it. I mean it's a lot of people are talking about them, but I mean rightfully so, right? You just change the game for three years. Yeah. So I guess what I saw was the Astros um, in in Pennsylvania Little Leagues. The Astros name will not be used. And this was a, a story that was in the New York Post. And um, you know, without going into it, just Little League baseball stands for what they stand for, and and they don't want teams to to have that name on their chest. And like that's that's pretty significant to me. It's uh, yeah. it says a lot about the depth of what really happened, and and just how that affected our yeah. game. Yeah, so it eliminates Alex Bregman, George Springer, all the players that can possibly get someone to enjoy this game for life. Those guys are already off the ticket now, and you've you've basically eliminated some of the reason of why someone's going to want to spend as much money as they're spending to come to the game. But um, just to touch on what you said about that Blue Jays pitcher real fast, I think that you're going to have mixed signals from different people. You're going to have just different differing opinions on that topic about how much – because a lot of people are laughing and saying, oh, it's ridiculous that he's suing. And, and I understand what they're saying. But I don't think what people understand, they don't understand how much things one thing turns into another in sports in general. My dad was supposed to be sent down. And the, he, as soon as he got called up with the Milwaukee Brewers, the ownership told him, hey, you know what, this guy is becoming healthy. I just want to let you know that you're probably going to be sent down. 
after this game. And my dad told him straight up, hey, um, like, I'm going to go out and prove who I am today. He, he said that to the ownership, okay? Now, if he was playing in that one baseball game, that one game, and the other team was cheating in a way to allow him to not perform to the level that he needed, he'd have been sent back to the minor leagues. You never know. All of a sudden, you tear your ACL, or all of a sudden, you don't have the confidence you once had because you're just not the type of player you want to be. The next thing you know, Gary Sheffield is just some guy who had 12 at-bats in his career. So you never really know what's going to happen. So you can't just be like, okay, well, that guy ended up stinking. I've seen guys stink in one place, and then they go another place, and they're they're great players. So to, to say that that guy could have had a real career in Major League Baseball and that the Astros didn't affect him, I think that would be completely far-fetched. I think it's totally realistic that that one outing can affect him for the rest of his life. So it's really, really sucks. No doubt. And there's it, there's also things, you know, like the amount of uh, the service time you have in the big leagues and how that affects your pension. And, like, there's a lot of stuff. There's, there's a lot of stuff involved that, yeah. that you know, I don't know all the ins and outs of, but I know that it exists, and I at least know enough to know that there, there are a lot of uh, ripples created every time something like that happens. And, in fact, that's one of the other yeah. things. This, I hadn't thought about this before, you know, right now, but that's one of the things that I know I've read in the past about um, the changes in the disabled list rules and, and uh, you know, going to the 10-day DL and how that affected guys going up and down. And I, and I heard – I remember reading last year just about guys saying, like, you understand how much this affects people. Like, the 10-day DL stuff, you can – you know, yeah. if you have a – have a 16 inning game or whatever, and you use all your pitchers. Like you can send some guys down and bring some other guys back up, and 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 use the disabled list or, or things like that. And and just like that really affects the amount of time get, that guys are are up and guys that are that are young that are still aren't making a lot of money. Like that's a big deal for some of those guys, especially when you don't know how long of a career you're going to have, and and the every dollar you make is pretty important to you. Um, yeah, with some of these minor league salaries, my goodness. Yes. Yeah, that's a whole other podcast in itself as well. Uh, yeah. Kind of sticking with the Astros thing, Gary, I, I want to talk about something maybe a little more serious, and this may be the last thing we get into. Um, I, I saw, you know, some some things on uh, social media that I think it was John Heyman reported that uh, uh, that Josh Reddick was, uh, had received death threats, which is certainly nothing to – it's, it's yeah. nothing light. Uh, nothing to joke about. That stuff is pretty serious and things that you that you need to take seriously and, and realize that it's just a game, people. Like we don't we don't need to get into that sort of thing for for anything like this. It's just it's just sports. Uh, anytime you hear anything like that, it's really uh, kind of makes you take a step back. But but I saw your response on on Twitter was that you received death threats because you're Gary Sheffield's son. Is that is that right. true? I mean, you you actually. You have experienced that just because of, of whose son you are in your life. Yeah, I, I just – the reason I posted it was that I wanted people to understand that I think – I mean, I've always been really big on mental health in this country. I just think that we're failing miserably. Um, I think that this generation – I'm 26 years old now, so I, a lot of people my age and especially the Generation X just right below me is struggling mightily because we're letting the words of other people and just some of the things that other people are saying are just taking over our lives instead of caring about what really needs to be cared for and worried about. Um, I think I'm not surprised. And yes, it's true that like people send me death threats every day, but what I wanted people to understand was that it, it doesn't affect me in any way. And the reason for that is that I understand what's important in my life and that's to affect the game positively, and that's it. So for guys, like, if you really go looking for it on social media, you're going to find just horrific stuff. I mean, there's 300, like, what, 330 million people in this country, and the Internet is not only limited to the United States. There's people from all over the world that get their two cents into some, I mean, not me, but very important people in this world, and they can, they're just one click away from sending you something that could change your day. So what you have to understand is that, negative people that are doing things that are over the line, they're always going to be there. Like we have to start understanding that, that those negative words and like some of the things that people are trying to do to affect your, they're affecting your day. Those, those people really like, they're only important if you allow them to be. So I just wanted people to understand that you don't need to, like, we don't need to give these people who are being so negative a platform 
when they don't deserve it. They haven't really earned that platform. And by when I say really, I mean, they've literally done nothing. And most of the time, the people sending these death threats, and rightfully so, they don't have their face on their profile picture. I always tell people, I tell people all the time, if you don't have your profile picture and you're saying something negative to me, I don't know what you're talking about. So it, for, for someone who's receiving death threats about the cheating and everything, there's going to be people up in arms about the cheating and they're going to cross the line every day. But to be honest with you, that just comes with the territory of the internet. It's just the world we live in and that we've got to learn to, to take a step back and worry about what really matters. Pretty sick what people what people will say, what people will do. Uh, it's really unfortunate, yeah. um, and, and it's wish that that wasn't the case. Um, how, do you, how do you deal with that? I don't know how long you've been you've been you've been dealing with it, or how long you you know when the first time that happened was. But that's got to be something that really shakes you to your core. But it seems like something that that you found a way to to kind of move on from. How do you how do you do that, Gary? Well, just some of the people I was around, just, I mean, I was raised by, my dad was always on the road and everything. So I was really raised by my mom and my grandpa on my mom's side. So one thing that my, I mean, really my parent, like my parents really taught me, my dad told me as well, is that the people who are critiquing you, the people that are sending you death threats, the people who are, you know, we had it in LA where people would sleep outside the house and you know, they chant all types of weird stuff. I mean, all the athletes and the kids, like they all dealt with this, around the same things that I dealt with is that if you're doing anything important in this world, people who aren't doing anything with their lives, social media was really created and it allows these people to try to, you know, stick at you all day and to affect and bring you to their level. And that you have to understand that people that are above you in the real world making real impact on people, they don't spend time picking at you. The, the people who are bullying you at school, they don't actually have good lives. It's, they don't, in their lives isn't enjoyable. Happy people don't bully people is basically what they told me. So they said not to worry about when people are nasty, when people say mean things. And trust me, like I've said things too that I regret. And I feel like everybody said something to somebody in their lives that they regret. And all you have to really think about is, were you really a happy person yourself when you said that to that person? And the answer would probably be no. So once you really understand why people are operating the way they do, then it's a lot easier to maneuver and be able to pick and choose some things that people say to me online and actually have a good experience. Because I love social media now. It's great. Great outlook. And just a thing, hopefully people that, that hear that, that can – you know, resonate, and it's, it's a conversation most people have to have with their kids at some point. It's a, uh, unfortunately, it's something that, that a lot of people deal with, and uh, maybe not to the level of, of you, but but the bullying, and things like that. It's, it's something I yeah. think you know most kids that are that are in school now are at least going to be around, if not experience personally. And uh, I mean, it's an issue. Like and like you said earlier, the mental health state of, of people today. Uh, social media is certainly not helping it. I I like social media for a lot of things, but I also think that social media is is a really bad thing in a lot of cases and, and not a healthy yeah. thing for society in general. Um, yeah. But, you know, what can you do but try to be a, a positive uh, influence and, and a, uh, you know, just, just have a positive impact in whatever platform you're given. So, Yeah, um, there's, there's definitely no manual for social media right now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Gary, I uh, appreciate you, you know, spending the time with us. I, I'll probably have to let you go now, but this is – it's Gary Sheffield Jr. who joined us on the podcast today. Um, I just sincerely appreciate you spending the time here with us. You can check him out more on his website, Athletes Wire. It's athleteswire.com. Um, I, I know that there's a lot of other good content that's coming out there. And, Gary, it's been such a pleasure. You're a well-spoken guy. got a great perspective on things. I think you have some great ideas. And I always love to see people that are using their platform to positively affect whatever environment they're in. And uh, I sincerely appreciate the things that you're doing. And, again, uh, your time today has been uh, really valuable to us. So thanks for joining the Figured Out Baseball podcast. Dude, thank you so much for having me, man. I mean, um, I'm just surprised that Twitter has allowed us to grow a community to where I can have experiences like this. And hopefully everything you're doing off the field with um, the coaches and everything, all the educational stuff you're doing with your own website, like hopefully all that stuff really works out and grows to the – to where we think it could head. So good luck to all that, man. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yeah, Twitter does do some good things, including get us in touch. And 
so we can thank Twitter for that. Uh, but Gary, thanks for everything. Uh, best of luck to you and the website going forward, and hopefully uh, you can be a regular here with us on the on the podcast. All right, man. Sounds good. Thanks. Thank you.